um, that being a pickup, they're going to have to at least be on that communication key. And I know for someone like Nine, obviously, who's a commentator, communication right. should be his key. It's got to be one of his strongest aspects, and he's definitely leading his team to uh, to at least the higher flames right now. We'll see if he's able to take them over just for the halibut. Now, as we go into this, this is round one of the uh, first division matches. We're going to be starting things off with Splat Zones on Muscle Forge Fitness. Yeah, Splat Zones, Muscle Forge Fitness is kind of its. Although Splat Zones is probably one of the most popular modes, Muscle Forge Fitness is not really one of the most popular maps. Not many play people really like it. Um, can kind of get locked out pretty easily, yeah. um, especially because of that bridge that you have to cross to get back into the middle of the map. Uh, a lot of longer range weapons can lock you up into your spawn. Yeah, due to the the pits that reside on both sides of the spot zone and the fact that it's only that one grate that connects them besides the walls that you can travel up, if a team is well defensively oriented, that lockout can just be fantastic. And if the battle moves even further, you have nowhere really to go. You have a thin path to uh, one side, and then your spawn is right there. Mm -hmm. So if either of these teams manages to lock out the other and they just stay stationed well and time their specials correctly, it could be a pretty quick game one. Yeah, definitely. And I know some people are probably saying, oh, you could always go from the bottom right or bottom left. But in most games, I'm sure you know about game mechanics. You always want to have the high ground if available. Yes, of course, especially on Muscle Forge Fitness. It's one of those maps that really emphasizes the focus on high ground because that's where a lot of the cover is on this map as well. And especially in a game like Splatoon, where you have weapons like Rollers and Sloshers that really excel at that high ground, they just rain down a lot of ink on top of you. You want to definitely be approaching from the same level, at least from um, trying to get back in. So Splat Zones, definitely Muscle Force Fitness can be a difficult task for a lot of people to come back in. With. Absolutely. And moving forward from that, we've got Clam Blitz on Humpback Pump Track. Now, we've been seeing a bit more of Clam Blitz lately, and it's that has been slowly developing. A lot less people are, um, are hating on it, at least vocally so. It's become a little bit less of a uh, of a polarizing game mode, although it still maintains a bit of that chaotic nature to it, regardless of a lot of tactics that are starting to be developed on it. And I feel like Humpback Pump Track is one of those maps that can emphasize a lot of those tactics. Mm -hmm, definitely Humpback Pump Track. Um, obviously, you're talking about Clam Blitz here, so the main strategy in Clam Blitz is going to be getting in with that baller and then super jumping to your teammate um, with the Power Clam to score. Um, and then other strategies like Bubbles, you'll have to pop in here and then try and hide behind those and then throw a Power Clam. And I believe, at least on Humpback Pump Track, both those strategies are definitely viable because uh, it's not that far from the middle of the map just to get to their goal. So, uh, yeah, you can go all the way around, but if you have a baller, you can just go straight ahead right on there. You're going to be at a little bit of a low ground situation, but because you're in a baller, it doesn't really matter. Right. And on top of that, we've been seeing a lot of that baller play, especially in Clam Blitz. And on top of that, uh, Stingray still alive and well, but Inkjet's been seeing a lot of play, especially mm -hmm. at this event. And I feel like that's going to be a uh, special that's going to help teams just further assert their control. Yeah, definitely, at least for the Inkjet. I know we've gone through so many different metas with the patches in yeah. Splatoon 2 that we started off kind of with Inkjet and Ink Armor, and we've kind of gotten back to uh, Inkjet at least. It went away for quite a bit of time before it got a couple buffs, but um, at least now I think people are more happy with this meta um, just because at least if the best special is Inkjet, it's kind of a special where it's like hands-on, so you know right. the person deserved the, the splat that they got. It's one of those specials where it's like, it emphasizes a high skill level mm -hmm. because you have to learn how to really control the jetpack, figure out how to you can like dip and dive by turning into the squid. And even at that, the weapon itself is just a glorified blaster. Yeah, so. definitely. You talked about right there, the dipping and diving. I feel like that's what separates um, the okay inkjet players from the amazing ones. Right. Um, you look at a lot of these players, these top players, they're the ones that you can see. They'll always be dodging your shots going up and down. And when I try to use the inkjet, <laughs> sometimes that doesn't work out for me. But oh, yeah, It's much harder than it looks, so you definitely <laughs> got to give credit where it's due. Yeah, definitely can be hard to definitely try to aim while doing that and then also dodging shots coming at you. So you got to give respect to where it's due. Um, we're actually going to be getting into this one really quick. Everyone is setting up into the lobby right here. We see Vote9 on the right right there. Nine in front, Monado Boy right behind him. And on the side of Just for the Halibut right there, they're looking like they're ready to go. Everyone's ran up. Yo, I, I gotta give a small shout out to these headsets that they've provided us from one of our sponsors. Like the Smash and Splash logo on top of like the blue on the black, clean. Yeah, definitely some pretty good looking headsets right there. I like the little Smash logo as well, the water. Uh, that one gets me every time. So definitely a lot of great sponsors are helping out make this event possible. Certainly, certainly. Mm -hmm. 
So looking like we're waiting on just a couple players here for either team. Um, just for the Halibut seems ready. So we're waiting pretty much on vote for nine. And it is Monado Boy. Must be trying to get some weapon pick coming out right here. Wondering what they're going to do. I'd like for at least, I know nine is a big fan of the Rapid Blaster. And the Rapid Blaster, at least on Splat Zone, Muscle Forge Fitness, can be a pretty strong weapon because it can shoot over that bridge and lock out the enemies. Or it could help you get back in as well. Right. I've been seeing a lot of uh, Rapid Blaster as of late, and I feel like um, it's going to really showcase itself on this particular start. We'll see at least uh, that alongside whatever other weapons they sp um, choose to support with. What kind of other weapons do you think we could be seeing? All right, well, we we're got it right in front of us. Right Let's here. see it. <laughs> is right now. We're actually going to be seeing nine on the Slosher Deco instead. Um, so they're going to be having a lot of ballers. And then on top of that, they're going to be having the um, Bomb Rush coming out of that splash matic So they'll be able to put up that turf coverage anytime they want. We've got three nine right here in the uh, orange. So we're going to be taking a look at it. But it seems like just for the Halibut actually gets the quick start on them and pushes them back. All right. Despite the fact that uh, those nine... Managed to get a couple of early picks. They weren't able to get very early up. Now, just picks left and right. No one really able to establish immediate control of center stage. Yeah, right now it seems like Vote 9's getting pushed back into their spawn here. It seems like Just for the Halibut has their numbers so far into this game. Now they're going into trying to get them into the lockout. And this is where it's definitely going to be a test for Vote 9 trying to get back into this. And this is where they have to make a break it. Mamba managing to make a pick with his inkjet. A lot of specials coming out from just for the halibut. Everything all interconnected, establishing immediate control, trying to push that battle a little bit forward. And I really like the usage of the specials here just because it was sequential. We already saw the inkjet, we already saw the uh, ink storm already start, ended itself out, and then the next two followed up just a further beat into vote nine. Yeah, right now we're seeing that lockout here. Katie tried to make something happen, but was spotted out, I believe, by Paige, and the rest of the team came in and finished them off right there. So now this is pretty much game. That was a quick one right there, just for the halibut, showing that they're here to go back into um, take this division one and then into that top 24. And just as you established earlier, this is one of those maps where once you establish control and once the defenses are up, it's almost unbreakable. Just yeah, sort of definitely. filled in the blanks of its own story. Yeah, at least for that map, I would have liked to see Vote 9. They had the baller, they had the uh, bomb rush as well. They had to build that up in their spawn and then push off of that, try to get back in. Um, otherwise, there was no possible way they could get in there. But we're, they're going to have to change something up going into our next map, which is going to be Clam Blitz Humpback Pump Track here. I believe 9 can stake on that Slosher Deco because it has the baller for sure. Sprinkler's good here as well. There's a lot of places you need to paint on this map. So he can stay with that. They just need a different game plan. I feel like their um, their loadouts as a team worked out fine. It was really just their approach to the map. And I feel like just for the Halibut came in aggressively, and they wanted to just stay on that. They wanted to keep the pressure up so that they can maintain the, their own momentum. Mm -hmm. So if we could see Vote 9 sort of turn the tables on them by responding with that same type of aggression, we could see a much more even-handed battle, especially considering uh, the presence of the bullet, presence of the specials that are on uh, Vote 9's team, at least with the loadouts that we've seen in Game 1. Yeah, definitely right there. I want to see Vote 9 now get pushed back into their spawn immediately like they did. Uh, we saw immediately at the beginning of the game, 9 was already into his trench area, and that's a place you never want to be. You're going to get picked off by blasters and people right above you, so definitely have to come up with a different game plan here. Kind of with Humpback Pump Track, there is a little bit of a trench area as well that you can fall back into, but that's not where they want to find themselves. They want to find themselves in the middle of the map, collecting all those clams, and especially in a mode like Clam Blitz, you want to maintain that center control, because from there, you're going to have the turf control around you, and that's going to tell you on the map where the clams are. Of course. And on top of that, uh, Humpback Pump Track is one of the maps that more facilitates flanking, where I feel like um, Muscle Forge Fitness is much more rigid in how it's established. It's much more easily defensible. Uh, Humpback is very circular in its nature. You can tell just by the overview right here. And a lot of that gives a lot of room for the enemy team to organize if they want to come in from both angles, if they want to try and pincer in towards the center to take that center stage like you had mentioned, or if they need to send in one around to try and establish control. Yeah, definitely at least coming in from that right side flank near into their spawn can get you maybe a sneaky clam blitz um, score right there. So we're going to get started right here. It is going to be vote 9 right here in the blue just for the halibut in the green on the other side. We do see Katie here trying to get into that middle control that they need to establish early. Seems like so far it's working out for them. They do have one pick and getting into this really early. 
Yeah, right now, not, not too much early ink control established, but the presence of the blue ink in center stage is going to allow Vote 9 a lot more room for being able to control the, uh, the spawn of the clams. And we already see, uh, just for the Halibut, established that power clam trying to press forward immediately, go for the quick kill, and already starting off with a point lead. Yeah, you saw Vote 9 had the early map control, but they weren't able to take care of those bubbles at any point, so that's going to allow Mamba to score right there. This is a push all the way down to 35. This is a huge push for Clambits right here. They're pushing it down even further. Seems like Vote for 9 is kind of scrambled at the moment, trying to make something happen. We see 9 sharking there, but he can't really do anything around that baller, and that's going to be the game. 100-0 right there. I didn't even let you talk again. You didn't even <laughs> need to. That match was done in a flash. Amazing play, and... It's very interesting because it was one of those organized plays where you don't see everyone all just thunderstorm in at once. It was just one after the other, constant drumbeat of pressure, and there was absolutely no way that Vote 9 could have turned that around. Yeah, honestly there, we see the, the, the KAs for both teams on the side of Vote 9. They only got one for two players. That might have even been an assist for one of them, so we don't know um, <laughs> right there. Uh, that was definitely a spectacle to see just for the Halibut Cut here coming to play up 2-0. It was just a very impressive play all around. Not even laughing with it. <laughs> Got to yeah. figure out some way to return that. Just as I was saying, as we were coming from game one into game two, a lot of that aggressive play from just for the Halibut was what allowed them to establish control. I feel like we we saw just more of that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right now, just for the Halibut, um, definitely didn't even let them have any chance right there. A game like that on a clam blitz, that's got to make you not really feel too oh, no, happy yeah. about the mode anymore. That's, that's going to get the other team shook easily. But Vote 9 still has a chance to come back for Rainmaker on Mako Mart. Uh, a lot of that aggressive play is going to sort of be turned around by the, uh, the flatter terrain of Mako Mart. And there's fairly linear paths to the, uh, the goalpost for the Rainmaker on this map. Yeah, at least on Rainmaker Make Mark, the main strategy of most of the top teams is going to be to initially try to push up onto the left side here. That's going to be the more safe option because the enemy spawn is actually on the right. So even if you get a couple picks, um, they're going to be spawning in from there. So they're going to be get, able to get a quick pick down onto the Rainmaker. But if you go left, that's going to buy your team a couple time, uh, a couple seconds more. And then from there, you're way better in a position to defend it. Right. And it's, uh, depending on how the um, the kills are established early on, that left side can even be like a quick finish right then and there, depending on how well they're able to time out. If they kill the enemy team all at once, or if it's one after the other, depending on how they organize those picks, if they have a say in the matter, it could be a uh, quick finish. And this could be from either side's teams. Yeah. Definitely just for the halibut here, looking pretty strong. They definitely came here to play as well, celebrating their one-year anniversary. Oh, yeah, they're fashion. celebrating in style. <laughs> yeah, definitely here. Going to see what these teams elect to bring out here. Uh, we saw Nine mix it up last time. He went from the Slosher Deco first game to the Luna. Let's see if he's going to elect to go for another Blaster. It could work out here. Blasters are pretty strong um, on this map in particular. can get a lot of those edges you see right here on our screen. There are so many different stacks um, that the Blaster can just shoot over and get anyone that's hiding up there. And just like that, we saw quickly a Clash Blaster was placed. Blaster on both sides. And... Is that a dynamo roller? For gold? Yeah, that is a dynamo roller right here. We've got the gold dynamo, something we probably haven't seen up to today, but uh, looking pretty strong right now. But actually, Vote 9 finally getting the first push of the day that they needed. Here's the left push we were talking about. Definitely, look, they have the position. Now they're able to defend. No one can really touch Katie from this angle, and, and she's going to be able to just stall it out and then wait for the correct push. However, we've got Mamba coming in from behind. He's going to manage to be able to get the pick with the inkjet. You know, trying to stay on at the point, but not going to be able to do it just for the Halibut. Turning the push around, most likely to get the, pit, uh, the pop on the Rainmaker. They've got it collected. Now let's see if they can push it to center stage. Yeah, going to be electing to go on to this right side here. This is definitely um, the quicker way to go, but if the enemy team had a Stingray, which is actually down on their side, they would have maybe been able to stop that. So far, that's going to give them the lead early, but the Rainmaker is finally stopped, reset, and let's see how Vote 9 responds to this one with them in their spawn. Now, the point lead that's established by Just for the Halibut isn't particularly substantial. There's very good opportunity for Vote 9 to turn the situation around, especially if they can get it out of that a bit hell's row of a trench there. There's so much defensible terrain around that area. They need to either reset or find a way to get a team wipe and push out. 
Yeah, right now you saw them go for kind of a Hail Mary push there. It doesn't work out for them. Uh, Vote 9 is going to be able to take it back in the, the other direction. Someone needs to get in front of 9, though. We see a couple players ahead of him. He needs one of his teammates to lead the way. He can't lead the way with that Rainmaker. Well, it's going to be very difficult. However, the Stingray definitely going to give a slight um, opening. And with just a little bit of ink established, it's going to be the Dynamo Roller coming in, being able to stop it. And I feel like the Dynamo Roller, while a surprising pick, makes a lot of sense on this map. Throwing, being able to throw a lot of ink regardless of how high up the terrain is, is one of those things that's able to negate a bit of that pressure from uh, controlling the high ground that the opposing team can establish. Yeah, definitely, especially when you're trying to make these jumps right there. The Dynamo can definitely prevent that because it has such a wide range um, to work with right there. So that was definitely able to help them secure the end of that push. They try to get something going on the other end, but Vote 9 is very quick to respond. They sort of have center map control, so this is the push that they're going to be looking for right now. Yeah, despite the point lead sitting against them, Vote 9's been doing a fantastic job of being able to establish in control on the map, as well as control the pacing of these picks. Regardless if they're losing squids, the other team is losing squids, they're sort of in control of the momentum of the battle right now. Yeah, Vote 9, though, is going to be taking the lead right there. Uh, not the most impressive lead in the game, but that's pretty good going up to about the halfway mark in the game. They've established themselves pretty well. Definitely set themselves apart from the last couple games, so they're looking pretty good right now. Ready to turn this one around, but just for the halibut, still celebrating so far. Let's see if they have another one left in them. Trying to make this push from the right-hand side a bit dangerous, but if they could sort of bait out the uh, specials from Vote 9, they could very well make the push from that side. In the meantime, the Rainmaker is trying to just sort of establish a few uh, lines of egg for them to run through. Not going to be able to do a lot of it, though. Yeah, we see that just for the halibut continues to try and push on that right side initially. Uh, I want to see them try and mix it up and try to go on the left. It worked out for Vote 9. It's probably the more traditional way to go, so um, at least try it and see if it works. You've got a minute left or so in this game. Uh, you have to at least try once to go on that side. Yeah, judging by the chaos of this match, I've noticed that both teams are kind of reluctant to take that safer path. There's not a lot of ink for them to run through and they just keep on avoiding it. They're trying to go for the quick and easy path. If they can get themselves organized, it might be able to work out, but right now it seems like that option is much more available to Vote 9 thanks to their ink control. We even see 9 off in the corner over there trying to establish um, a better control. Pops the armor, see if that can turn around for the team. Yeah, the armor there does allow him to make sure that he stays away from that dynamo flick. So he's going to be all right here on this left side. He's looking for a couple picks onto the clash pressure. Actually there gets he a gets triple him. there with his suction bomb plus his nice shots from his uh, end zap there. So that's going to allow Vote 9 to move in even further if they want to. But I think they're going to take this one slow. It's a fair, uh, fair point for them to make as far as getting that kill and just going for the ink control. They already have the lead. They don't need to make any sort of aggressive plays. They know if they were to follow 9 into enemy territory, they would have been going in on everyone being in spawn. It would have been a bad move. So, excellent choice on Vote 9. See if they can maintain this lead in the last 30 seconds. Yeah, you mentioned that right there. Last 30 seconds. So, the custom jet squelcher for Vote 9 definitely wants to build up that stingray and make sure that they can maintain that for any last second push coming out from just for the halibut. But that Rainmaker reset is going to make sure that they have to pop it right there. And they do just for the halibut. Has one last push in them. They pick it up, and this is going to be it for them. We see 9 coming in from the back right there, but seems like El Hot just manages to get right by, and there goes oh, Monado Boy. And just Steven like it. that, Monado Boy staving things off the last five seconds of it. The push not going to be enough, and Vote 9 staving off the 3-0. Yeah, and we saw Monado Boy right there. He was hiding up on that stack area. That was going to allow him to, if they decided to push on the other side, he would have been able to quickly rotate there as well. But luckily for him, it was right in front of him, an easy pick. The Rainmaker was in front. He had no one to deal with, and Monado Boy gets an easy pick for himself, ends the game. Excellent play from all the members of Vote 9, able to turn around with potential 3-0. Just showing that they're here to celebrate Smash and Splash as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. Definitely showed their composure staying in this game. Um, Rainmaker um, that was on Mako Mart right there. Maybe one of their strong suits, though. They're going to have to pull it out in the next one here. It's going to be Tower Control, Sturge, and Shipyard. Rainmaker and Tower Control probably um, the most similar modes um, of the four. So maybe they can pull some of that momentum into the next one. The only problem with this one is they're going to have to go through a couple checkpoints here. Yeah, this is going to be a bit more of a difficult push, although it's going to be very much the same note as Rainmaker on Mako Mart in that it's very segmented in how these battles are going to take place. And if they can maintain more control of, the, uh, of ink as opposed to just going for constant picks and building up a body count, I feel like Vote 9 might be able to maintain the momentum they've garnered in Game 3. Yeah, Vote 9, we saw earlier in that game, they had established map control pretty much throughout. That was the name of their
their game there. And maybe that was Nine's switch to the end zap. The end zap is a pretty good turfing weapon, so that could have definitely helped him out right there. Let's see on tower control, Sturgeon Shipyard. I think, honestly, their, the comp that they chose last game may be able to work out on this one. They had a blaster for tower control. They had the Stingray if needed as well, plus some turf. So definitely they don't have to change too much up here, um, but they can if they want to. Yeah, there's a bit more wiggle room given the layout of Sturgeon Shipyard. It's a lot more laterally oriented than Mako Mart. Uh, it gives a lot more uh, more room for chargers, uh, in general more long-range shooters, so we could possibly see Splattershot Pro, um, maybe uh, Squelcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially at least on Sturgeon Shipyard in general, um, a lot of the ways you're going to have to deal with the enemy team is they're going to be up on those spinner areas and that snipe um, that are surrounding the center stage. So definitely, if you can take control of the enemy side from there, you can rain down ink on them. You'll have positioning on them, especially during your push, which is going to come around on that right side. Well said. We're going to be going right in swift for tower control on Sturgeon Shipyard. You'll be shortly seeing what the teams are coming into this game mode with and seeing if any of our predictions have any impact onto this. All right, we're going to be getting it right now. Vote 9 in the yellow and just for the halibut in the blue. They pretty much stayed with the same exact comp on the side of Vote 9 here. And we've got these Dabble Dooley's new vote and the Rapid Blaster Pro coming in for just for the halibut. So that's going to be two ink storms that they're going to be able to pull out here and maybe facilitate themselves in a nice push. I like the choice of the multiple ink storms for this team because as we saw in game three, a lot of what allowed Vote 9 to maintain their control of the map was how they were able to easily cut off just for the Halibut's um, methods of moving around the map. That amount of ink control, or at least uh, playing it very offensively, made sure that they were able to move around on their terms. If they can keep that up with their same style of control and having the specials that further facilitate that play, I feel like we can further see the control uh, fall into Vote 9's favor. Yeah, we saw Vote 9 there getting the early start push right there, but doesn't work out too much for them. They didn't even get past the first checkpoint, so um, still have a lot to go on their next push here. Just for the Halibut, though, is starting to establish some mid control, trying to get into this middle part area, but Katie seems to be pushing them that. They pop the inkjet to deal with Katie, but can't seem to figure out exactly where she is, and she jumps out. Now, coming into Surgeon Shipyard, one of the more important aspects of uh, maintaining a lead on tower control is getting to that second checkpoint. While this first checkpoint is, of course, uh, very important to establish for the sake of building a lead, it is very easy for the opposing team to turn a reversal and get that first checkpoint on their own right. But yeah, once right that second one comes around, it's going to be a lot harder. We saw right there, Nine actually got them at the last second for that checkpoint to pass. So that was a clutch stop for him right there. They're going to have to deal with going around that whole checkpoint again on their next push. So let's see what Vote Nine does on their own. Nine now popping that Incarmer for his team. Hopefully they can go in off of this one. Nine is already in there. He's dealing with a 1v1, but it seems to be turning into a 2v1. He goes down in a trade, and Elhot's coming in onto the tower right here. And so far, it seems like they're able to stop this push. Katie coming down with a splashdown, able to push back the rest of just for the halibut, and the tower is just going to return to neutral. Uh, Paige waiting for an opportunity to press forward, trying to get some sort of aggressive play here, throwing bombs, throwing ink storm, trying to at least press back vote nine so that they can't turn their own lead. Yeah, so far it seems like both teams haven't really established too much control in mid, going back and forth throughout this game. Paige seems to be in a one v one, but the player um, probably goes down to one of their teammates here. And so far, it seems like this push is just going to be stalled, and it's going to be a pretty slow push. No team really going into the enemy spawn side yet. As opposed to the previous games that we've seen, things are going to be much more evenly matched on this. It seems that both uh, styles of aggressive play that we're seeing from teams is sort of butting heads. There's no particular amount of uh, control in center stage. Uh, no one's really been able to establish any strong pushes. Specials have been particularly scattered. We've only seen various armors for attempted pushes or an ink storm here and there. Nothing well too coordinated from either side yet. Yeah, you mentioned it right there. They do have the inkjet as well as the armor, so maybe they need to combo, combo those together. That's kind of the classic um, combo in Splatoon 2. Maybe want to see a little bit more out of that, but Nine already popped his armor, got a couple picks from it. We do see Monado Boy at the top of our screens also has his inkjet, so maybe he's going to use that soon or wait for Nine to get another armor. Might be the pick, because this push seems to be over. 
Yeah, it remains to be seen how well these teams can organize themselves, but once again, the tower returning to center stage, a very slight lead sitting in favor of just for the Halibut. And I feel like they're they're able to establish this more through just um, firefights, individualized firefights that are assisted by a lot of toxic mist presence on the blue field. Yeah, definitely that toxic mist right there. Two on the side of just for the Halibut, one on the side of Boat 9 have been thrown around to stop a lot of those tower pushes. And although, you know, it's just a sub weapon, it definitely forces them off the tower pretty much not as strong as a Stingray, but it'll buy you some time. Yeah, it's definitely one of the best team-oriented uh, subs that you can bring, especially bringing multiple of them onto this map, where the path of the tower is so well constricted around the geometry of the map. I feel like it finds a lot of use, and we're seeing that from Just for the Halibut. Yeah, actually right there, Just for the Halibut's going to go down in a full wipe. Um, most of Vote 9 is in their spawn, so that's going to buy a lot of time for them to push that tower forward. You see it's moving towards that second checkpoint, and if they're able to pass that, that's going to be a huge landmark, as you mentioned earlier in the game for them, but it seems like Just for the Halibut finally got the composure down and going to stop this push. Just a quick note from uh, quick note for Monado Boy. During that push, we saw him press forward with the inkjet. We saw a direct kill. We saw the rest of the, uh, just for the halibut sort of aligning themselves to take him out right away, sort of alleviate a bit of that pressure. And I feel like that response is what allowed Vote 9 to have a bit more of a substantial lead, especially as they continue to control the tower and ride it forward. Yeah, we see Regent right here trying to push that tower forward. They also had a Stingray ready as a custom Jet Scorcher. They might have just wanted to save onto that instead of pushing the tower. Didn't really need to do so, but hopefully they're able to build up another one here soon and not allow Vote 9 to touch that tower. It is going to be jolts on that tower with that Rapid Blaster Pro here trying to make something happen, but seems to be pressured from all angles. Most of his team is going down. He's going to go down as well, and that's going to be Vote 9 right there taking it. He's tying this one up 2-2. Two, two. Getting pintered in from all sides. There's just nothing that Joel could have done in that situation. And while they did have the ultimate push going from the opposite side past center stage, they had no in control forward. They had no squids up to defend Joel on the tower. It was just sort of a dust boss at that point. Now we're going to be going on to another Splat Zones map right here. It's going to be Splat Zones Whaler Warehouse. If you remember though, Vote 9 kind of got stomped on a Splat Zones map earlier. So um, we're going to have to see how they respond. And honestly, um, although they're not really the same terrain wise, Muscle Forge Fitness and Walleye Warehouse, which we're going to be playing on on this next one, uh, both of them are prone to lockouts. And uh, if 9 gets in that position once again, they're going to maybe go down. Yeah, you bring up a very good point. While the layouts are certainly different of these maps, they're both very defensively oriented. We know there's not that much room to cover as far as ink goes, and there's a lot of choke points on this map. If um, Just for the Halibut is able to maintain those choke points, keep the high ground, they, we very well can see a similar knockout as we did in game one. Yeah, definitely here. Um, a lot of this map is just so constrained, as you mentioned right there, those choke points. You've got the right side closed area, that's the, the kind of the alleyway that you can go in, but a lot of people won't elect to go from there because if a, a longer range weapon is covering that area, you're not going to get in for right. sure. So um, maybe you want to go from the mid or down that left drop um, from your spawn. So we're going to see how they elect to play this one out here. They don't want to get caught up in a position where they're struggling so hard to come back into this one. Um, and maybe if they just elect to let's all go left or let's all go mid, maybe that'll work out better for them. Certainly. Now, one note that you had mentioned is how the uh, the inkjet has just been a constant presence for the metas of Splatoon 2. Uh, with Walleye Warehouse being one of those first maps to come into Splatoon 2 from the previous game, I feel like this map in particular further facilitates that um, Stingray, sorry, that Stingray style of play because of how laterally oriented it is. It really is just a glorified hallway, and the Stingray does such a good job of controlling so much space, even from one Stingray. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that right there. Definitely covers down a lot of those choke points, and even throughout the, the center of the map, um, you're kind of constrained. It's really just a little rectangle that you're dealing with right there, so the Stingray is definitely capable of getting a lot of splats for your team, putting up a lot of that pressure, but uh, even though you didn't really mean it right there, the inkjet here is pretty good as well because you've got so many um, elevation points that you can get to here. So let's see if Monado Boy on that 10 second inkjet, that's gonna work out for him later, but um, so far we're gonna be getting into it right now. Vote 9 is trying to get something going, but Katie's gonna go down right away. Or actually, um, another player, my, my bad right there. Katie finally does go down <laughs> though, and so far it seems to be a pretty even fight though. Monado Boy is trying to make something happen. 
and it's looking pretty good for Vote 9 on this start, way better than the last Splat Zones. Yeah, things begin out in a bloodbath, but it manages to end out in favor of Vote 9. They try to establish a bit of in-control on the sides, and I actually really like that idea. We see him out of like, peeling off screen right now, sort of establish ways for his team to be able to fall back if they want the option to be able to come in and uh, flank. They have that available to them safely as well as also being able to give him that special charge. And we already see him with the Inkjet trying to contest out the opposing Inkjet on uh, Just for the Halibut side, who is now trying to contest the main point. We saw right there the Inkjet was used on top of that crate right above them right there. And that's kind of a dangerous position sometimes when the enemy has a lot of long-range options. But if you look at the, the comp for Vote 9, uh, they don't really have that to defend an Inkjet from that position. So it worked out for a little while, but Vote 9 is going to turn it around. And they're going to be in control so far. Page, though, does get a fat missile right there, kind of locking on onto the whole team. That's going to allow it to push up onto this. Let's see if they're able to cap the zone. We had just saw two specials that you and I hadn't previously talked about, but are definitely offering a lot of control to this map, both the bubbles and the Tenetech missiles. Because this is such a um, claustrophobic map, I would say, especially on the splat zones, there's a lot of room for Tenetech missiles to be able to control the space. And the bubbler itself is also able to close off a lot of those uh, choke points on the map, giving a ton of room for ink control. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned right there, and especially when you get the, um, as many players as they did get locked on right there, they're going to be scrambling all around. Callouts are going to be mixed up, and that's going to definitely allow your team to push forward in on them here. So just for the halibut, turning things around, trying to build this um, push further, maybe get the lead on this one as well. If they're able to maybe win this next team fight here, should give them the lead here. But we see Monado Boy using that ink jet on the right side. They've got the armor up as well, so this is going to be a pretty strong push. But look, Elhot's sharking right up. They don't see him right here. Just trying to get something going. Over uh, Vote 9 maintaining a little bit of a lead right now. They've got a few less uh, penalty points, but the battle right now very bombastic. Both sides losing equal squids. Uh, jo jumping onto Mamba, trying to get some sort of push forward for just for the halibut. But the in control going into 9's favor right now. Yeah, Monado Boy here is trying to feel out on this right side. I think he knows that there's a player besides him right there. So he's going to be working with his teammate to pick up that splat right there. And so far, it seems like just for the hell it was able to turn it around. But the numbers advantage is going in favor of uh, Vote 9. So they're going to be able to turn that zone around real quick here and it seems to be a huge scuffle in the mid for that zone and it goes in favor just for the halibut. Now it's just time to see if they can maintain it. We've seen these battles going left and right. However, with a full wipe on vote 9, uh, just for the halibut has the opportunity to push this much deeper than normal. We see them already sitting on that platform just ahead of spawn for vote 9. And while vote 9 has shown capabilities of being able to fight past this and making use of the uh, sidewalk, uh, sidewalks on this map, I feel like being pushed that much further just gives a lot of room for just the howl of it to take off a lot of those penalty points and we already see them all broken trying to break forward with a small lead. Yeah, right now Vote 9 just needs to well, make sure that all their members are out of the zone. We need to reset this push. We've got one last team push left in us. We need to be quick about it. Um, but just for the hell, it seems to be maintaining control. They know that there are players off to this right side. It's already been called out here. Vote 9 now needs to react quickly. Can they cap the zone? They do and stop it momentarily. And they're they able cap to cap it. Look at that, leaving a 61 point lead penalty on just for the halibut. It's going to be a world of hurt for them to break past that, especially with only a minute counting down onto the clock. Vote 9 trying to fight for some sense of control. They've got majority ink on the plate. However, Paige trying to go forward with the Clash Blaster, take out those bubbles, try to get some sort of a lead. They manage to cap the point. However, they have to break forward 60 points in penalty. Yeah, they're probably not going to um, end up knocking out on this map. Um, even if it goes to time because they'll be in position already with the lead so probably not going to be seeing a knockout or so if Vote 9 is able to cap the zone once but it doesn't seem like that's the chance right now as they're going down in numbers. Um, Regent's the last one up but they're going to do the wise thing and wait for the rest of the team trying to approach back from the middle of the map but the rest of the team has to come in quick. They've got about 10 seconds. And Regent manages to get a spot with one of the suction bombs, gets his bubbles ready and starts throwing with 17 seconds left. It's not enough time. Just yeah. for the Halibut is able to get down to the final point, and they take the set in 3-2. Yeah, just for the Halibut right there. We mentioned this is their one-year anniversary. That's the one way to start it. So they're going to be feeling good about the.